there's the 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is one of the prophecies of Zechariah that's very famous. You all know that this is about our Lord Jesus. The foundation for all of our hopes lies in the ransom price that was given by him. And of course, this was our heavenly father giving his son on our behalf. We're going to look at the ransom today in a variety of contexts and symbols and scriptures and prophecies. We're going to have five narratives primarily that we focus on. One will be Zechariah. The other will be the tabernacle. The third will be Abraham and his offering of Isaac. Fourthly, the experience of Joshua as they crossed the River Jordan. And five, the work of Nehemiah and Ezra, who was a teacher under him. We're going to see the ransom intertwined in all of these experiences and prophecies. Now, on the screen you have there for you, Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. It's a very famous prophecy. They weighed for my price. 30 pieces of silver, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of Jehovah. Now, this prophecy in Jer Isaiah, excuse me, Zechariah chapter 11 is um, part of the ending prophecies of Zechariah that kind of change the point from the early chapters. Now, chapters one through eight of Zechariah are prophecies of Zechariah who lived during the Persian period. Now, Zechariah and Haggai and Malachi all lived during the Persian period of Jewish history. So this is after Babylon had been an empire and we're into the Persian history and the first eight chapters really deal with that. Although there are prophetic contexts that take you farther. Starting with chapter nine, we move on to the Grecian Empire. And we won't spend much time there, but nine and 10 are all about Alexander the Great and how he is a figure of Christ to come who will bring peace to Jerusalem in verse nine. And then in verse 13, there's the struggle of Israel against the Grecian overlords that proved difficult. In chapter 12, there's the prophecy about the period of the Maccabees. Now you all know the book of Maccabees is not in our Bible, but it does record things by which God saved them. And if you want to find prophecy of that, you can look at Zechariah 10. Then the prophecy moves on to the Roman period. So 11 and 12 take you to the Roman period and then onward to the kingdom. And then chapter 13 and 14, again, take you to the Roman period and then onward to the kingdom. So in chapter 11 in the Roman period of history, this is where Jesus appeared. Now, because the infidelity of Israel in verse 11 of Zechariah, excuse me, verse 10 of Zechariah 11, it says, I took my staff, even beauty and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had with my people Israel. And of course, the death of Jesus and the abandonment of Israel from righteousness and from their own God-given Messiah is what caused that band of the covenant to be broken with them. It'll be restored. They'll have a chance. We see that coming to pass in our day, still a little future for that covenant. But this takes you to the Roman times when they gave up Jesus. Now, the prophecy in Zechariah on these two verses is really about Zechariah and circumstances then but we know it's prefiguring our Lord Jesus because Matthew 26, 15 quotes it, applying to the 30 pieces of silver that Judas sold Jesus for. And after this, uh, this uh, the 30 pieces of silver, you may remember what happened to them. Judas uh, regretted what he did. Now, I've heard that the words that express his remorse aren't the same as other words that express a deeper or truer remorse, but he was remorseful, so much so that he killed himself in consequence of what happened. But then he took the 30 pieces and he gave it back. They, would, they just threw it on the steps of the temple. They didn't know what to do with it, so they, uh, they, they couldn't put it in the treasury because it was the price of blood. 
So they bought a potter's field and that really fulfills verse 13, casting this to the potter. That potter's field was a place to bury people. And of course, I think that means that the redemption price of Jesus is ultimately gonna to go to the burying of all these people to bring them back from the grave. And of course, potter reminds you of the fact that we are all clay vessels and we're all going to be finally restored, mankind in the kingdom, we have heavenly hope, of course. So even the casting of the 30 pieces to the potter, to the potter's field, I think is indicative symbolically of what those, what the price of our Lord Jesus is going to secure for mankind. We're gonna go on from here to the tabernacle. Now you all think of the tabernacle when you think of redemption. And when you think of redemption, uh, I'm going to suggest, uh, first of all, that we focus on the number 100. You know that the gate of the tabernacle of the court, which is not depicted here on this illustration, but the gate was 20 by five cubits. The door was 10 by 10, the veil 10 by 10. So you have 100 square cubits in every case. And I'll suggest that this numerical link not only tied into Jesus, but links the three areas together. So that Jesus is our way into the understanding by faith of what Jesus has done. As soon as you enter the court, you see that altar, that brazen altar, we often call it. And then you approach to, after you do a little cleanup work, you approach to the door and you begin a sanctified life in Christ. And then you enter the veil into life beyond which is the hope of every one of us to have that privilege of seeing our master going into the presence of God and being used of them for a profitable, profitable benefit for the rest of mankind. Now, around the, the foundation of the tabernacle is not spoken of too often, but it is in Exodus chapter 26. And that foundation was, again, 100. These were sockets of silver. And that silver came from the redemption tax that every man paid for his soul. And as a consequence, we think of the foundation sockets of silver of the tabernacle, 100 in number, again, a picture of our Lord Jesus. And the connection with the redemption price of every man's soul suggests that Jesus is going to be the redemption for every man and every person. Now, you'll find those sockets of silver mentioned, excuse me, the, the source for the sockets mentioned in Exodus 38, verse 25. The silver of them that was numbered of the congregation, that is, to each man to give a half shekel as a ransom for his soul, was an aggregate of, well, all of these shekels that it mentions there. And of those shekels, 100 talents plus a little change was used for the tabernacle. And those 100 talents went into the foundation of the tabernacle. Now, there's another reference to one shekel of silver being the price of a man's life. You'll find this in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 39. It says that King Ahab, who was not a good king, let another king go free that he should not have. And so the prophet said, thy life shall be for his life, or you'll pay a talent of silver. As though to suggest a talent of silver was the value of a man's life. And therefore, each of these sockets of the tabernacle, grounding God's plan of atonement, I think represents the value of a man's life. And this is what Jesus gave for us to redeem us all. Now in the covering of the tabernacle, you have four coverings. We won't talk too much about all of them, but <clears throat> the first is the linen covering that was uh, embroidered. That's why this first one looks colorful and not white. And that represents our spiritual hopes. And above that was our justified flesh. These were goat skins. And there were six pieces, six strips and five strips, six showing how we're still under the old fleshly arrangement, although justified, we're not perfect. And five showing our part in the new creation. 
Now over that was this third covering, a ram skin dyed red. And we're going to talk about the bird offering quite a bit. And a ram was the customary offering for a bird offering. Dyed red, the blood of Jesus, who was our ransom. That's a covering for our imperfect flesh put right over that goat hair curtain. Overall, that was a, another covering of flesh that the world sees. But the ransom covering our imperfect flesh is depicted by the ram skins dyed red, Exodus 26, 14. Now we get down here to the altar. I referred to it earlier as a brazen altar because we often do. Uh, engagingly, it is never referred to that way even one time in the entire Old Testament. Now it is true that when Solomon's temple came, there was an altar made of brass, as it says. That's the closest we have to the expression brazen altar. But in the tabernacle, the altar was made of wood and defined that way. Now, it is true that after Exodus was finished, in the book of Numbers, the experience occurred that caused them to line at least part of the altar with plates of brass. And that sometimes we call it, why we call it the brazen altar. That wasn't original. It's put on later. Originally, it was an altar made of wood. Now you can imagine that you can't burn an offering on an altar made of wood exclusively. So halfway up, there was a grating and that grating was made of brass. And that grating is where the, act, the actual sacrifices went. So this altar was called an altar of burnt offering 17 times in the Torah. And it was made of wood. Now, as we're going to suggest as we proceed in our lesson, wood, always reminds us of the wood of the cross that Jesus died on as an atonement for the sins that happened on the wood back in Eden. Now, it is Peter, the apostle, that says Jesus suffered and died on the tree. Now, in the Greek, the word for tree and the word for wood are most often precisely the same word. So when Jesus died on the tree, he died on the wood. Reminiscent of where the sin originally came from. And we're going to see that word wood come up time and again in the rest of our study as emblematic of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Now this altar, I believe, represents primarily, I should say, the burnt offerings put on this altar are said in Leviticus chapter one to provide atonement for the offerer. That's what a burnt offering does. It gives you atonement and it is entirely consumed. You don't eat part of it. You don't save it for meat. You entirely consume a burnt offering just as Jesus was entirely consumed in his offering to redeem us. Now, when you look at the institution of the law covenant, you'll find there were burnt offerings and peace offerings. Peace offerings rep represent our devotion to God. Burnt offering is what gives redemption. When you look in Leviticus for the burnt offering, you'll find it right up front. Leviticus, the first chapter, in enunciating for eight chapters, all of the very, excuse me, seven chapters, all of the various offerings in the tabernacle, the fundamental one was the burnt offering. That's what's described first, and that makes atonement. Now there's something about the burnt offering further that's unique to any other offering in the tabernacle. And that is where you put the offering. In Leviticus 1.7, it tells you, and the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And then in verse 8, the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts, now the bird offering here, the head and the fat in order upon the wood. That's it. The bird offering always goes right on the wood. Jesus' offering went right on the cross. 
Now, when you look in the third chapter and you talk about the peace offering that represents our devotion and our consecration to God, it says that offering goes on top of the bird offering, which is on top of the wood. Because our devotion and our consecration depends upon our redemption in Christ, which in turn was given right on the wood. And we're going to move on to Genesis, the 22nd chapter. You all know this chapter very well. This is the chapter where Abraham was told by God after 50 years of promises that now you have to take your son, your only son, and offer him for an offering. Now, there's a lot of details in this 22nd chapter of Genesis that bring our attention earnestly to the fact that Isaac was a picture of our Lord Jesus and the once for all atonement for sin. Now in Genesis 22 verse 2, when God appeared to Moses with this request, he said, you have to take to your, your son to one of the mountains of Moriah. And when he did, and he went to Moriah, He's basically going to the same place that much later Jesus would be himself offered in sacrifice. Now we know that because of a later reference to Moriah. Uh, <clears throat> and that reference was at the time of Solomon's temple. And he built the temple on Mount Moriah. So when God said, take your son to one of the mountains of Moriah, it actually was a foregleam of the very location that Jesus would die. That is in the environments of Jerusalem. Secondly, he said that your son is going to be a burnt offering, a very specific kind of offering that provides atonement. Thirdly, you all remember when Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad. But Abraham was a long way off from Jesus' day. And it's interesting that in verse 3, it says, excuse me, verse 4, on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off. Now, as it happens, Abraham lived more than 2,000 years after Adam. Therefore, Moses, excuse me, Abraham lived on the third day of human experience. Now, Jesus was still a long ways off, a far distance off from when Abraham lived. But Abraham, by faith, on his third thousand year day, lifted up the eyes of faith and the promises of God. And he saw a long way off the day when Messiah would come and would recover us from our sins. Now, as they're going up the mountain, it says specifically in verse six that Abraham took the wood of the bird offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Notice that Isaac is the one that is specified to have carried the wood for the bird offering up the hill. Well, you remember, of course, that Jesus bore his cross. Now, it is true that Jesus was so weak that though he began to do that, in route, Simon the Cyrenian, Cyrenian had to help him with forced into labor. I think that was a blessing for Simon the Cyrene. Think in the time of, well, the millennial kingdom, and I think Simon will be in glory then. What a reputation that will be to have carried the cross of Christ. Now, we all want to carry the cross of Christ metaphorically, but he actually did it literally. And we know that he and his sons evidently were part of the Christian community later because they're referred to in greetings later by Paul. So Isaac carried his, the wood up the, the hill. And then he said to Abraham, as anybody would, here's the fire, here's the wood, where's the lamb? And so Abraham said, God will provide a lamb, my son. And we would like to mention that that lamb was Isaac. That's not a mystery. But in my mind, I remember that 
later when God intervened and seized Abraham, stilled Abraham's arm, that they saw a ram caught in a thicket and they offered that instead. But you notice it's not a lamb. And the whole discussion was about a lamb. The lamb was Isaac. Isaac was accepted by God because he, God saw that he was willing to give his son. He didn't allow it. He withheld his hand. But of course, you all know that when the real fulfillment came, there was no stilling of the hand. God gave his son for my sin and for every one of us. Now that ram caught in a thicket is interesting. Only recently did a dear sister point out to me a symbolic point there that had escaped my attention forever. That ram was caught in a thicket by his horns. That meant his head was embedded in that thicket. And that thicket, I presume, was a thicket that had thorns. And you remember that Jesus had a crown of thorns placed on his head before he died. It was this occasion of Abraham offering Isaac that God took the opportunity to swear by an oath the promise he had made with Abraham. Now, I think I remember, maybe it was Brother Tom earlier today mentioned any promise of God. Once he's promised, we just wait there for the fulfillment. We know it's inviolate. So it's highly irregular for God to declare with an oath that he will fulfill his promise. This was the occasion. And I think that's meaningful because this is the occasion of the picture of the sacrifice of Jesus as our ransom. And that provides an inviolate guarantee that everything predicated on that sacrifice will be done. Now, right after that, in verses 16 to 18, God said, reiterating his promise to Abraham, your seed will be like the stars of heaven as the sand of the seashore. And that's all comprehensive. And those are the two ages of redemption in symbol, the gospel age that will call the stars of heaven class and the millennial age that will bring the whole world of mankind back into harmony with the heavenly father. Everyone will be blessed. That's the key to the divine plan is two ages of redemption. And when did those two ages begin? Right when Abraham offered Isaac symbolically, when God offered his son, then those two ages begin to unfold. Now there actually was a third description of the seed of Abraham. Do you remember going way back to Genesis? Well, I believe it's the 14th chapter, 13th chapter. This was Genesis 13, 14, when Lot had separated from Abraham. And now Abraham is there alone and God speaks to him. And God says to, I, to Abraham, look now to the north and the south and the east and the west. You see all this land? This is going to be yours and your descendants after you. Now, Abraham didn't actually get that for 400 years. And then his seed, the nation of Israel got it. And then he said, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. No sand here, no stars here, only the dust of the earth. May I suggest that the dust of the earth is unique to the nation of Israel who will actually inherit the land that God showed to Abraham. So why, after the sacrifice of Isaac, don't we see three descriptors? May I suggest it's because this dust of the earth had already received the promised land earlier. And now the part of the Abrahamic covenant to follow is going to be the two ages of redemption that pertain to the stars and the sand. Now, if you look and see how those two, the three designations used, dust, star, and sand, they're used very precisely. And I think that dovetails with Israel under Hagar, the star class Isaac under Sarah, and the whole world of mankind to be blessed by the spiritual part of the covenant with Abraham, Keturah, in the kingdom. Now, interesting, the sons of Keturah were later sent to the east. And it reminds us that Eden was eastward. 
perhaps just a symbol of the fact that the six sons of Keturah, representing mankind under 6,000 years of sin and death, are going to be sent eastward to paradise again as a consequence of the ransom. Now, shortly after that, they heard news from Nahor about his 12 sons. The time is against us, so we're just going to have to mention that shows the latter fruition of the Abrahamic covenant to bring Israel back and through them bless all the families of the earth. Must move on. Okay, Abraham started at Ur of the Chaldees. He went on to Haran, perhaps the Jewish age. Then he went on to Shechem, perhaps the gospel age. And at Shechem is where the altar is mentioned first in Abraham's experience, because the beginning of the gospel age is where the altar of sacrifice was fulfilled. Then he moved on to Bethel, built another altar, there at the house of God, the meaning of Bethel, perhaps showing that the sacrifice of Jesus will have a second impact during the millennial kingdom of Christ. And that's it. Those four locations, there were other places in Abraham's life, but in this narrative, in this sequence, that's the end of it. He moved on to Egypt and we got on to another story. Okay, I'm going to go back to Joshua, go forward to Joshua crossing the River Jordan. We've been studying this in our class in San Diego recently, so this is at the top of our mind. When Joshua crossed the Jordan, he came from one side of the Jordan, the east, to the west. And I think that represents a transition from the old world to the new world. And that transition will take mankind into the kingdom. Crossing the Jordan reminds us that Jordan means judge down. And that's where the judgment of God is exhibited so that mankind is going downward, downward into the sea of, well, death, the Dead Sea. But it's going to be relieved. We're going to have a relief from that curse. And when Joshua began to cross the River Jordan, you remember the priests went first and as soon as their toes dipped into the water, the water began to recede. And in Joshua, for 3 verse 16, we learned it receded because of some obstruction up farther north at the place of Adam. Well, that's where the ransom is going to be applied for Adam, and the curse is going to stop. Now, there's other details we can't have time to enumerate here too much. But notice that it was on the 10th of Nisan that Israel crossed the Jordan. I think that that's meaningful that at the opening of the kingdom, Israel is just going to be introduced by the ancient worthies to the fact that Jesus was their Passover lamb. The 10th of Nisan is when the Israelites selected a lamb and therefore identified the lamb that was to die for their sins. I think here by showing the crossing of the Jordan on the 10th of Nisan, we have a little prophetic suggestion that this is the first time Israel nationally begins to recognize the one appointed for them was the Messiah whom they had rejected so long ago. Then they were circumcised after that as Israel will be nationally repentant because they hadn't been circumcised for the 40 years in the wilderness, just as Israel during the gospel age has not been circumcised spiritually, but they will now. And Gilgal, their tent represents, the meaning of it is, their reproach will be rolled away. And finally, on the 14th of Nisan, they observe the Passover with all of its particulars, as Israel will, when Zechariah says, they shall look unto him whom, him whom they pierced, and mourn for him as one mourns for their only son. There's a lot of thoughts here for following that we're going to pass by, but the, the remainder of the story of Jericho and Joshua are full of things about the ransom. We're going to pass by that, however. I'm going to move on to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, is about three people. The king, Artaxerxes, Nehemiah, and the teacher under Nehemiah, whose name was Ezra. Now, I'm going to suggest that king represents the heavenly father himself. 
Nehemiah represents our Lord Jesus, who's going to build New Jerusalem, as Jesus does. He's the one that builds the church. And I'm going to suggest that Ezra, who was the teacher of the people here on this podium of wood, represents the teacher appointed under Nehemiah to instruct spiritual Israel about the divine plan. Now, at this time, I think we're at the harvest period of the age, when finally the completing work of the church is done. And therefore, in this case, I think Ezra would represent the one of the seven stars that is active during the harvest. That would be Pastor Russell. Now it says that in Nehemiah 8, 1 and 2, this episode in chapter 8 began on the feast of the first day of the seventh month. Now the seventh month was the feast of trumpets, first day. This was the last of seven trumpets and takes us to the harvest symbolically. And I think that represents the opening of the harvest. They're near the water gate. <laughs> water is truth. We're now as the church at the end of the age to get a full message of truth. And Ezra, the scribe, stood upon a pulpit of wood made for the purpose. Wood represents the ransom. That is the foundation for our whole understanding of the plan of atonement. On one side of him were six Levites and on the other side, seven, making up the total of 13, which is the number of the ransom, the perfect one, Jesus, who died to atone for us as sinners, six. We don't have time to name it all the places of 13, but if that's not familiar, give a little, a little research and see if, see if you might agree. And then there's another 13 Levites also on that, in that area, causing the people to understand the law. And I think that represents all of those during the harvest that are helping the mess, distribute the message of the blessed kingdom that's coming. And they found when they were reading in the days of Ezra, they found something they had forgotten. They had forgotten the feast of the seventh month. Now, we know that as the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's a picture of the kingdom of God, according to Zechariah, the 14th chapter. That's what Christendom has lost all the time. Now, it doesn't say they forgot about the Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because the whole Christian church through the Gospel Age has known Jesus is the Passover lamb, and they've known the seven days of accepting Jesus as our Savior. But what Christendom has forgotten is that there's a second age of redemption. They've forgotten about the feast of the seventh month. They've forgotten about the feast of tabernacles and how they build booths and observe that. And so they began to observe that, picturing the appreciation for what the thousand year kingdom is going to bring to every man, woman, and child. 30 pieces of silver, that's the value symbolically. Why 30? Well, you know, Jesus was three days in the grave. His price was 30 pieces of silver. Mary anointed him for his death with 300 pieces, 300 pence rather, of ointment. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people believed. You see the trend? <laughs> three is the number of redemption, of atonement, because there is God there is mankind here below, and there's somebody that stands between us to step in between to provide redemption for us. Now, there's another scripture in Zechariah, another one in the 13th chapter. Remember, we mentioned 11 and 12 are one narrative that take you Jesus' day and then onward to the kingdom. But you've got that in chapter 13 and 14 also. It's repeated. Now, for this, we're going to go to Zechariah, the 13th chapter, verse 7. And you know the scripture, too. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn mine hands upon the little ones. Well, you know that refers to Jesus, the shepherd of the sheep. And you know that when he was smitten, 
as he said in Matthew 26, 31, all you will be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I'm risen, <laughs> there's the hope. That's what followed after he was risen. Now, when you go on to chapter 14, there's unclarity about exactly when this gulf of 2000 years should be attributed. Now, here's a suggestion for you that in Zechariah 13, verse number seven, in verse eight, he says, it shall come to pass in all the land that two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third part will be left. And I will bring the third part through the fire and I'll refine them like silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried and they shall call on my name and I will hear them and I will say, it is my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Who is that one third brought through the fire of trouble at the end of the Jewish age? Well, that would be Christian believers who are brought through that fire and were spared. But two parts were cut off. The political and religious rulers were both cut off. They didn't last. They ended. And now in chapter 14, behold, the day of the Lord cometh. I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. May I propose a question for you if it hasn't occurred to you before? Is that Jerusalem battle the one in 70 AD or the one introducing the kingdom? I asked that question to a variety of elders and I got a surprising answer. That is that it was in 70 AD. As I pondered the issue, I actually think that that is the right view. Now I'll give you a reason for this, but we have or hardly have time to discuss it. This is from brother Albert Hudson. And if you look at Zechariah 13, verse seven and eight, where we started, all the way through Zechariah 14, one and two, you will find this is different than, er, than all of the rest of Zechariah 13 and 14. This is poetry, not prose. This defines this section as a united section. And after verse two, we go back to prose. And after verse two, we jump, may I suggest, 2,000 years of history, speaking roughly here, and then Jehovah shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And to summarize Zechariah 14, introduce the millennial reign of Christ and bless all the families of the earth. That's the final result, dear brethren, that we're going to receive from those 30 pieces of silver. Our eyes have been opened to a wonderful truth. The ransom is the foundation for every good thing we have. Thank you.